and welcome back. And what a lively discussion we had there about diversity and inclusion. And also, just uh, let me remind you that Women in Construction Forum and Awards, I was probably more excited about the concept of maybe uh, the date in March, but actually the date in March is just when the entries will be open. So you don't all have to rush to Dubai. Of course, we're going to hold that one for September when we see you all hopefully back here for the Big Five 2021. But keep an eye out because the date for entries, the Women in Construction Forum and Awards will be open on uh, March. So just we got about three months to get ready for that, get everything prepared and make sure you keep an eye and see what you need to make sure you get in there and get your entries in. It'll be very, very exciting. And we look forward to hearing more from you. Now, of course, uh, we're going to continue our coverage. We have so much coming up for you. And we're going to really be looking now at how the pandemic has affected sustainability in construction, particularly looking at shaping urban life with circular design. I wanna thank Wolf Systems. This is our sponsor for this session as we really look at how urban life will shift, will change. So much going on here when we look at uh, circular design. So I'm very, very happy to welcome to this session, we have the Chief Sustainability Officer from Majid al Futem, that's Ibrahim Al-Zubi. So delighted that Ibrahim is joining us for this conversation. From the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, the Circular Design Engagement Manager is with us, Anna Carol Puentes. So it would be great to hear from Anna as well, and also from Grimshaw the practice lead for sustainability, Dr. Paul Toyne. So we have a great panel. And indeed, I'm going to hand over now to our very capable moderator for this session. He is the CEO of Wolf Systems. So I'm absolutely delighted that Michael Obermeyer is with us. So Michael, over to you. Thank you, Etna. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our audience. Shaping urban life with uh, circular design. What are we going to discover today? Circular economy is by far more than only a more responsible recycling practice. Today we are going to discuss what circular economy is and how it can impact our daily life and our businesses. As per the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, a circular economy is based on the principles of design, designing out waste, pollution, keeping products and material in use, and regenerating natural systems. The circular economy looks at the entire life cycle of a product, moving the focus from a product-oriented perspective to a social and environmental one, such as how we manage resources, how we build and run buildings, and what we do with the buildings afterwards. Developing urban spaces following the principles of a circular economy is a process which requires different stakeholders and an interdisciplinary approach. So we have to consider for designing for a circular economy that we have to follow a holistic design approach which implements different principles, like the reduction of waste and pollution when we design buildings and urban spaces with the resources and the energy conservation in mind. We have to design uh, considering the product life extension through uh, ease of service and maintenance, keeping buildings and infrastructures in use, and thinking already about an adaptive, adaptive reuse and repurposing to extend further the product life. As well, we have also to consider uh, ease of disassembling and recycling when we look at the buildings as a material bank. We have also to consider that circular economy induces innovation. 
the way we shape our cities as per the circular economy will require new business models and innovative building systems which can transform the circular economy with the right combination of technology, smart engineering and innovation. Talking about innovative building systems, we have also to consider that the building industry is moving fast towards digitization and off-site manufacturing. These new solutions of creating buildings can strongly contribute to reduce significantly the construction waste, increasing at the same time considerably the quality of construction and therefore to extend the product's life. Finally, the circular economy generates also synergies for healthy environments. Since circular economy centered and sustainable urban spaces contribute substantially towards healthier living environments, enhancing of community well-being and increasing of planetary health. So let's now move straight forward to the questions to our panelists. Sustainability is much more than a lifestyle and it has a direct impact on our quality of life and the way how businesses are organized. Anna, how can sustainability and in particular the circular economy positively impact our daily life and our existing business models, especially in the construction sector Hi. <clears throat> Hi, Michael. It's a pleasure being here. Um, well, this is a really good question to start with because um, as, as uh, we are trying to transition towards a more sustainable and circular future, we need to analyze and question how our current system looks like first. So the reason why we're talking about the, the opportunities in the construction sector is because at the moment, uh, construction demolition uh, accounts for 40% of the urban waste. And even before COVID, offices were used around 40 to 60% of its time. This means that there's a huge opportunity in the material side, but also in like the use and the way we uh, utilize the spaces at the moment. As you well said, um, the, the circular economy principles, designing our ways and pollution, keeping products and materials in use and regenerating natural systems. It's an opportunity to create an economy that is restorative and regenerative by design. Um, and so how can, applying these principles benefit the built environment and create a sector that's um that's uh, long lasting and resilient and also like it's conscious of the limitations uh, of the resources of this planet to to start with like um applying circular economy in the built environment it will create more resilience uh, to volatile price, prices in raw materials we know that the fluctuation of prices in this industry it's really high and thinking about um what types of resources we are using and how we are using them it's a way for for this industry to be resilient then uh, it will also help maintain uh, the natural ecosystem because we will be able to keep track of uh, the types of uh, resources quantities and where we are placing them and then also very important and something that affects to us and our quality of lives, which is that we will be creating urban areas that are livable, uh, productive and convenient for everyone, not only for those that um, like uh, have a work that's paid and all that, but also for like the work that's done inside the homes that's like behind the scenes and many times is not accounted for. So um, 
In this case, value is creating by using design technologies and new business models that can manage healthy and non-toxic materials and resource and keeping resources in the loop and maintain them at their highest possible intrinsic value. Um, so we can talk about um, the, the two main areas. I think it would be the circular design and business models, but I'm not sure this comes in a second. For sure, I mean, uh, there are benefits for the business models and we will discover for sure these this benefits uh, along with the next questions of our panel discussion. So for now, Anna, I think these are very fascinating comments and we should also highlight that circular economy looks far beyond a more, recyc a more responsible recycling practice. So the product life extension is also a key element of the circular economy, which promotes the adaptive reuse, reuse and repurposing of infrastructure and buildings and the recycling of construction materials. Paul, which strategies should be implemented while designing urban spaces that can be repurposed and where building materials can be recycled, upcycled, or even reused. Hello, Michael. Um, thank you very much for that uh, question. Um, I think the, the strategies that we deploy depend on the circumstances. So if we consider that we have, in some parts of the world, uh, aging infrastructure, and, and the buildings that are, are in need of refurbishment. So there's, that's one set of circumstances that will uh, require different strategies. And then we've got a, another um, situation, which is the uh, development, development of new towns and new cities and the infrastructure that's going to be needed for them. So in the, in the former, where we're talking about the refurbishment and the renewal and regeneration of our exi existing cities, then um, it's really uh, important to understand what's already there. So that takes us into um, data and information and actually how we can then reuse and repurpose those buildings and that infrastructure. Without that information, almost like an, an inventory of what we have, we can't really consider what we might choose to do with it and how you would then stimulate um, a response from the marketplace, whether that would be the response around the contractors or the um, suppliers of, of materials. So, um, a couple of key things here in terms of um, strategies for the circular economy in existing buildings and infrastructure. Um, in many cases, it helps if the infrastructure and the buildings are actually liked and loved by the community and the people that use them. That is really important because there's more chance of those buildings being saved. I mean, clearly in some parts of the world, we have uh, regulations and laws that protect the heritage of some buildings, and that typically means that the facade, the front of the building is, um, is protected, and then the interior is then changed and repurposed. Um, and we, Grimshaw, as architects, we've got examples of how we've been doing this for the last 30, 40 years, very successfully. However, you need then to be considering in the design of these buildings, how you might want to repurpose them in the future. And of course, understanding the future is difficult. But if we know that the building is loved and is liked and it provides a function for where it is in that community, that's important. Secondly, and particularly in infrastructure, uh, we find that we cannot afford to stop that infrastructure working. So automatically, we're looking at uh, the product extension of that infrastructure. A good example of this would be uh, a train station where it's really important to keep the, 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 the flow of people in and out of our cities, for example. A really good example is in London, where I'm speaking from, London Bridge Station, 
um, is a, um, an adapt adaptive reuse um, design from Grimshaw that reconfigured the station, improved the capacity, which has environmental and social benefits, at the same time as keeping the station working. And so we reused the vast majority of the existing infrastructure and the, and the buildings surrounding to ensure that we could get that continuity. However, if we then move into redesigning new cities, new towns, and new infrastructure, we've got to take a, a, a really big holistic approach. And it's not just around construction materials. It's around how vital services fit together, whether it's water management, uh, waste management, in particular food, energy provision. Um, and what architects and urban designers are now doing is looking at holistically um, and that would include a mandate to, to design buildings for disassembly so that they can be repurposed or, 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 or adapted for a future use. So that thinking is there. And I'm sure later on we'll discuss some of the challenges around what we need, need to do that. So really the, 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 the main takeaway about this is different strategies for different circumstances. Uh, data is key in understanding what we've already got and then how can you best adapt it? And then in new circumstances, deploying the principles of the circular economy right at the beginning, but thinking more broadly about how a city or a town works is really important. Thank you very much, Paul, for your very interesting uh, thoughts. And definitely, design in this case, we can't as designers uh, anticipate or know what will be the future requirements for an adaptive reuse or repurposing of buildings. But what we can do is to think about flexible solutions, flexible design solutions, and how to make this repurposing as flexible as possible. So talking about urban spaces, we have also to consider that construction is one of the most, inten most material intensive sectors. And the circular economy is an opportunity for both the environment and businesses. Anna, in this case, which are the enabling conditions we need for companies to move effectively from a linear to a circular economy? that reduces waste and pollution? And how can this create new revenue streams and new job opportunities throughout the supply chain? Thanks for the question. Um, well, uh, we know like it's, it's a challenging one. As Paul was saying, um, it like it's not just about the buildings many times, it's about the whole city and, and trying to understand how to create synergies between sectors. At the same time, yes, we do have some uh, recommendations based on a report that we wrote together with Arup. Um, you can find this report, it's called From, pra From Principles to Practices, Realizing the Value of Circular Economy in Real Estate. And here we talk about how to um, what are the, some of the business cases and opportunities that uh, we can, in, like companies can invest on uh, to be much uh, like resilient and invest in a long-term solution for the built environment. So some of the, and there are five basically. The first one is um, a model called flexible spaces. As we said, like we need to try to, um, rethink how we are using um, like interior spaces such as offices and also the, the homes where we are living in as we are currently like not utilizing them at the fullest potential. The second one, it's um, based on the fact that buildings are typically demolished before they reach the end of their technical life and adapting the assets and consider their value that's, uh, that's created. It's, um, it's an element that can help uh, changing the market conditions and the social expectations by being able to adapt and 
change alternative uses. And we have some examples about this. So for example, it's tested uh, on a residential development in Denmark and found to increase its internal rate return, rate return by 3% over 50 years. Then we have other elements such as like questioning whether we need to have buildings on the site, on the same site always. So uh, why not to, to create buildings that can be moved and relocate them so that we keep the materials in use, but like we do not uh, jeopardize uh, like the land and the construction of the whole city or town around. The fourth one is about the material depreciation. So the residual value model envisages the creation of tradable future contracts related to the value of building materials at the construction. So basically like, um, can we transfer the ownership and cash settlements uh, taking place upon the construction after which the materials re-enter the market for reuse? And the fifth, fifth one is about the performance uh, procurement. So basically products as a service. Uh, we probably do not always need to um, have all the elements in the building that belong to the owner of the building. But for example, we can have uh, ventilation systems, lighting and other um, uh, building services that are based on a, on a um, uh, product as a service model. So we just pay for the light that we use instead of the lighting element. And all these five uh, business models um, are, uh, are great for the long-term investment. So if there are companies that are trying to investigate like how to dig deeper into opportunities for long-term investment in buildings, that's great. And about the, the job question, Michael, that you mentioned. So we also recently uh, released a paper on the opportunities for the built environment um, based on the COVID situation. And there's basically like two main elements. The first one is about refurbishing and upgrading buildings not in all the parts in the world, but for example, in Europe, we've realized that there are a lot of um, old buildings that just by refurbishing them and like adding some insulation, changing windows, et cetera, et cetera, we can increase the quality of life of people living inside. There's some uh, packages at EU level given by national, local and regional governments. And now it's a time to improve um, the performance of buildings. And this will enable the creation of jobs, um, given that the constructing industry has demonstrated that in the last years, it can absorb jo job losses from other industries. So it's a way for first improving the quality of life inside the buildings and the performance, and second, create jobs at local level, because these ones uh, normally are uh, created with like skills and competences from people that live in the areas. And the second opportunity, it's about, as Paul was saying also, the digitalization, like the, the reusing uh, materials and creating infrastructure to make sure that we keep track of the materials that we are starting to use for new buildings. And for example, we wouldn't necessarily need to start creating buildings with new resources, but if we know exactly what is put in previously built uh, buildings, we can just deconstruct and bring them into new constructions. So I think the main takeaways would be this, like we have five types of models for businesses that want to invest in the long term in the circular built environment. And then two main opportunities coming from, from the COVID uh, unfortunate situation, which are based on the uh, refurbishment of the buildings and uh, building infrastructure to make sure that we keep products and materials in use uh, throughout digitalization. Thank you very much, Anna. So I think this was a very fascinating analysis for a quite challenging question. 
So keeping also products in use and designing out pollution are, as we heard, key elements of circular economy. Paul, um, considering the product life extension, how important are quality of construction and energy efficiency to reach this target? And how do you value high-skilled personnel and an integrated approach throughout design and construction processes to enhance the product life time? Well, if I may, I just want to return to the question you asked Anna, because it, this is relevant for this question too. And I think one of the main or important drivers for the circular economy in the built environment, and particularly construction, is that of policy. Uh, and what we're seeing is, is a number of uh, major uh, cities trying to reorganise their economies so they become circular. Um, London, for one, um, where I'm speaking from, um, is attempting to do that. And then when you think about what ingredients you need to you know, drive what we're really after. So we're after high performing, good quality, affordable buildings and infrastructures that create a great sense of place and a livable city, if we are talking you know, specifically about um, cities and, and the urban environment. Now to do that, uh, we need the right kind of policy. Uh, we need the developers uh, and the people who are in control of, of, of buildings uh, and investing in buildings, understanding the significance of that circular economy. And then we need a supply chain that can deliver good quality, affordable products and services. So this is the point of your question, Michael. So if you have good quality interventions. And we, we've seen this already, even in the UAE, where you move to off-site construction and we start to look at modular construction. So for example, I know making a, um, a pod for a bathroom. So it's, it's assembled outside of the building, um, maybe for a hotel, for example, and then it's taken to site and it's assembled. There are a number of advantages. So in the, in the factory controlled environment, you can manage your resources uh, and ensure that we don't waste those materials. We can also ensure the quality is the highest possible and you can test the products. That's very good. You can also save time on the, de on the delivery of your program in the construction, uh, which is very important. And another key component to this is health and safety. So we're reducing the amount of time spent by people on building sites um, which sadly is still a place where we do injure people. So there are benefits of having uh, offsite and modular. And then clearly, if those um, components can be designed so they can be disassembled or indeed reused and moved, like Anna was talking about, then that also provides um, uh, uh, the, the opportunity. But we need to recognize that we need to build capacity in that supply chain. And it just doesn't happen overnight. So that's where you need clear market signals that give confidence for businesses to start investing um, in, in those new business models, in the appropriate equipment and facilities so that they can be part of that circular economy. And that's where policy comes in. And that gives confidence to the developers. That sends a signal that this is the kind of uh, construction that, that we want. Now, uh, as uh, Anna's mentioned, you know, the implications of the COVID pandemic around health and well-being means that we will probably need to be thinking about repurposing our buildings for health and well-being, but also for their actual purpose. Um, as we see a lot of city centres struggling now because people not visiting them. Uh, we also have the second um, uh, impact, if you like, which is of, of uh, and you mentioned uh, energy performance. And we know 39% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions come from the built environment. Uh, and in so increasingly, a number of them come from embodied carbon, which is in the carbon associated with the manufacturing of these materials that are used in, in construction. So we have an opportunity to actually decarbonize our construction um, system um, at the same time as developing benefits around health and well-being and actually delivering those high quality, affordable um, buildings that people actually want 
and that and developers can uh, enjoy because of the the value of the asset not declining. So I think we we need to recognise that we don't have everything in place right now. We don't have all the necessary information, and we don't necessarily have the capacity and expertise in the value chain everywhere to to move into that circular economy. But we are building that capacity. But it needs to come by policymakers first, saying this is how our cities need to adapt and be thinking about the future. And from there, it can all stem. Thank you very much, Paul, for your very interesting and insightful uh, comments about this question. And this leads us now also to the next question. So we saw right now, we, saw, or we spoke about the businesses and how we can implement circular economy. But the client's leadership itself is also a key element to implement sustainability and the circular economy in construction. And clients play a huge role in providing the demand for circular economy solutions and stimulating developers and the supply chain to innovate. So, Ibrahim, how can circular economy-centered properties and their positive implications for businesses and quality of life become more appealing towards customers, investors and organizations, despite being sometimes more expensive than traditionally designed and built spaces? Um, thank you, Michael, and uh, thank you, Paul and Anna, for the informative uh, uh, information that you shared with us today. Um, first of all, I hope all of you, uh, my colleagues in the panel and everyone uh, watching us is in safe and uh, healthy and well and managing this pandemic that the whole world is living now. Um, uh, I just want to add a uh, couple of facts uh, that as developers or as investors or as owners uh, or as a stakeholder know about uh, uh, the circular economy and the planet. And this is based on UN uh, reports, World Bank, um, IMF. We know that by uh, 2050, uh, Michael, that we could need uh, three times more resources as uh, a global society than we are current, we, that we currently use. Also, uh, now, uh, we, uh, the, the way we live, uh, the current situation is unsustainable. Uh, globally, we require, require now 1.7 Earth uh, to meet our demand uh, of, uh, for natural resources, uh, to bury our waste, and just to live uh, our lives. Also, on the other side, uh, we've seen, we talk about circular economy here, so I would like to uh, focus maybe more a little bit on the economy part, because this is where it can, becomes interesting, especially post-COVID-19. Uh, a recent study as well uh, showed that the transition towards a circular economy could unlock more than $4.5 trillion uh, and global growth opportunities. This is a huge number. So uh, from a risk assessment, compliance, to into new opportunities to invest, uh, it's a no-brainer. Uh, moving towards circular economy, though, uh, requires full uh, systematic change. And listening to Anna and Paul, uh, I can tell that the, the system is there and the change started. Uh, but the main point we need to understand that, uh, so we know the what and we have the how, thanks to organizations uh, like uh, Paul's and Anna's, uh, that it needs uh, a full systematic change with everyone, all stakeholders must work together to turn theory and uh, talks into practice uh, at, at a scale. Circular economy is not a new thing. We're not inventing. Circular economy has been there for centuries. You know, if, you want to, if I want to bring it closer, think of your grandparents, think of your grandmother, think of your mother, how they used to reuse things uh, at home, at farm, uh, extra food uh, to the chicken, to the sheep. So we had circular economy. The necessity and the awareness and the high demand, or maybe investors and customers, started uh, to 
uh, service, uh, w what we know of a circular economy now, to embed it within the business, as well as the climate crisis we're living in. So it's not about, we're talking about future. We are living right now uh, a climate crisis. We are living uh, an environmental degradation, which makes everyone step, stop uh, to think uh, and act. Of course, for us, uh, it makes perfect business sense. It's not about it costs us more or less, believe it or not. Being sustainable by default, and I hope uh, we have more developers and investors in the audience, may cost you more, but it will cost you less in the long term. And by the way, it may cost you even less, and you will save more. So uh, from a pure economic uh, and uh, return on investment uh, formula, straightforward, it does make sense for the, for the business. It's also uh, becoming crucial to ensure uh, our world also can adapt to emerging climate risk. Why, why could investors uh, or uh, people like us, uh, developers, do that? Because there is a, a customer demand. There is a demand. Uh, we have the millennials now. Millennials are not just young people uh, acting. They are customers. They are staff. Uh, they are decision makers. They want uh, a proper product. And a proper product is a sustainable product. They, they do care. Where, they, where this product will end up. There is a, a pure cost saving, long-term profitability, uh, license to operate from pure compliance perspective, as well as brand reputation and uh, a citizenship for us. Uh, just uh, I'll wrap uh, the answer for this question with utilizing post uh, COVID-19. COVID-19 has been, uh, had a negative impact, but if you, if you ask me if one small positive thing of COVID-19, is business as usual is dead, no longer is exist. If we are doing a reset and the world will reset post COVID-19, circular economy will be the new economy. So if you think economy by default, default should be circular economy. And by the way, we do have the how, you know, uh, uh, we have good, ex we just need to talk more about it. Like the train station, the tube in, in London, it's a great example. You did not stop the business. You did not stop the economy. You did well by doing good. Yes, uh, Ibrahim, I totally agree with you. So especially this year, 2020, is inducing and increasing uh, for the real estate market, especially relevant disruptions. And I think circular economy-centric um, developments, which provide healthy living environments and more durable properties are a new opportunity for developers. And do you think this can be a new opportunity for developers to come up with a unique and resilient offering, allowing developers to stand out from their competition to champion these challenging uh, times? Uh, thank you, Michael. It's not a new, uh, it is an opportunity. And I'll give you examples. Uh, we see, if I look uh, at PwC's uh, going circular strategy, they had three phases and they started in 2007. Then they thought of uh, zero waste to landfill, they reuse and recycling, and then circular solutions by 2022. Google's circular Google uh, economy strategy, they looked at an overarching goal. They are looking at overarching goal to maximize the, the, the reuse of uh, uh, finite resources across Google's operations. And they looked at their supply chain, they looked at the workplace, they looked at ele consumer electronics, they looked, to, they, they looked at consumer engagement and supplier engagement. I'll give you an example back home here. And uh, for us, how we, uh, when, when we think uh, of circle economy, and by the way, uh, we do have a commitment. We have a sustainable business commitment when it comes to uh, circular economy. So uh, it's there. The opportunities there are good, good example. Um, uh, we use we we've been using and still uh, recycled aggregate uh, in our communities uh, for pavements, uh, roads. Uh, 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 not in buildings yet. Paul mentioned the government regulations because if you want to use it in buildings, we need to go through a long process to become eligible. So that's a, a challenge that we need to tackle. Also, uh, we, need, we design for flexibility, uh, not, uh, the, not uh, 
uh, demolishing. So uh, we have a multitask floor. We think of how we can the other uses of of uh, of uh, of the asset itself of the property. The refabricated design in communities has been amazing. We've been using it in our community. Is uh, almost uh, no waste at site, so it's all precast of site. Also, uh, an, an important thing to look at, especially in this part of the world and the region, is we look into uh, retrofit and renovation uh, rather than demolishing, which can be easier to do, but uh, you can even come up, be more innovative, creative when you think retrofit renovation than demolishing. Uh, we started also, even in our shopping malls, existing assets to use all our marketing materials. So it's not only properties, it's within the properties. We think, how can I approve this campaign thinking that I'm going to use the same material for the next five years or 10 years instead of uh, uh, designing a stage uh, every year. Also, uh, in uh, last but not least, and among lots of examples, uh, we tried uh, to reduce, to use circular economy to reduce our embodied carbon. So in my, in my city center, Masdar, we use around 50% uh, GGBS. It's a ground uh, granulated blast furnace slag, which is ash. Uh, it's uh, like cement-like uh, material uh, to replace the cement in concrete. Uh, and this contributes, we use the circular economy strategy to contribute to our net positive uh, uh, commitment by 2040 to, to reduce our embodied carbon. So it has an indirect uh, impact on your uh, uh, climate uh, carbon, carbon emissions target. So uh, we look at the life cycle. We have a sustainable building policy. Uh, we look at the LCAs as uh, main building elements. So we ask the question of the life uh, cycle assessment of the material used. So my, the, my point of these examples is it's not, it's not a new opportunities. The opportunities, we are using it. In London, they are using it. Uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation are lobbying for it. So if you as a business and investor don't join this train, you'll be missing it. And your work, your business at, at risk because it won't be either in compliance with regulations or just customers will stop coming to you. Thank you. Yes, Ibrahim, I totally agree with you. So thank you very much, Anna, Ibrahim, and Paul for your very interesting and fascinating thoughts. So look, uh, looking at the sustainability and in particular circular economy, there are considerable uh, social, environmental and economic benefits involved, especially from a long-term perspective, where users, businesses, investors and governments can benefit from. Always keeping in mind also the planetary health and a sustainable environment for the next generations to come. So we concluded now our panel discussion and the stage is now open for questions. And thank you, Michael, so much. Thank you for moderating that panel, really looking at circular design and looking at what's going on in terms of the construction industry. Thank you for doing that. And a big warm welcome to all of you here for joining me now, Ibrahim, Michael, Anna, and Paul, to have you all back here. It's great. And Ibrahim, if I may stay with you just on what you were talking about, I found it fascinating. As you said, you know, nothing new in many ways, but everybody has to get on board. But also you're saying that this really requires a full syndemic change, in fact, to make sure that everybody, that, that we do the right thing at the right time. And as we start a new decade, even though we might have got off to a little bit of a bumpy start, what better time to really push this one through? Talk to me a little bit about, and particularly what you're doing too. I mean, you know, you're doing so much with Majid al fudaim indeed regionally and around the world. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I believe uh, the way we had before uh, COVID-19 wasn't so sustainable, the business. And the business community uh, was talking about that we need to change the way we run business. I think now post-COVID-19, people start to talk about great reset. And being a sustainability practitioner, it's a great opportunity to embed sustainability in day-to-day -day business and day-to-day -day lives. 
And circular economy is no different, no, it's not away from that. Circular economy been there for ages. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, the, the, how people used to live or do business, even including in construction, reusing materials, looking at local sourcing materials, people used to implement it. And guess what? The buildings that time even used to stay longer, used to be even better uh, uh, in some ways uh, in well-being. And so the great opportunity we have is to be part of a great reset where all stakeholders think of this existing system. And it did not work. The first time, we, well, we have another pandemic we, used, we live uh, is climate change, but with the first huge pandemic is people now in, the, in, this, in this century, people uh, identified that we need to work together. If one fails, we all fail. So there is a great opportunity to look into the systems we have, restart, uh, be part of the great reset we will have. A look at circularity, look at materiality, abundance and natural resources, and look at different ways. And guess what? A lot of people started to think the same uh, and through organizations like the, through events like, like this, through World Economic Forum, through governments, we started to see progressive governments and progressive uh, people elect uh, to talk about these things. Now, what we do, we started this uh, uh, almost more than nine years ago, where we identified that uh, the business, our business model won't be sustainable for long run for the next 20 25 years in 2017 we thought what we what we we are we are doing right now isn't enough so we came up with a new business model where we said we're going to dare today to change tomorrow and since then not one single decision we do in our business with the, uh, that we don't include sustainability as part of it a good example our net positive commitment where we decided to not only to reduce or eliminate, but also to be part, to give to the environment more than we take. Uh, we decided to be net positive in carbon and water by 2040, and this is what one of our negative environmental impact. Now, talking about retail, for example, talking to circular economy, uh, in our Carrefour stores, we use a lot of single-use plastic. Uh, we've decided last year that across all our operations in the 16 markets, in the MENA, in the GCC, uh, Eastern Africa, uh, GIS, CIS countries to eliminate our single-use plastics by 2025 in, from all our operations. Uh, this created and launched an amazing innovative ideas for new business ideas that we needed to work and also opened a lot of doors for us when I talked about systematic change uh, to work with the governments, uh, to uh, act as their advisors, and even to to help them with pilot projects. Uh, hence, now we've been in, uh, invited to sit on the, the Circular Economy UA board uh, and the Climate and Environment board to give a private sector uh, feedback on this. Now, if we don't do that uh, post COVID-19, there is definitely a risk on compliance and a risk on missing opportunities. And this is where I believe the systematic change should change, not only in, in private sector, but it will change on the financing system and the government system and the decision-making system, as well as at the end user, as well as customers. No, thank you for that, Ibrahim. And when you think about it too, it's about taking that leadership position. I love that, you know, dare today for change tomorrow. Uh, well done. And we'll talk a little bit more on that. Anna, when we look at what's important in terms of actual circular economy and putting those strategies in place. You know, you also mentioned to, you know, a lot of buildings that are already in place that need to be retrofit and that can um, be retrofit as well. So it's it's about really, again, taking a wider view on this too, but making sure that uh, the buildings that already exist don't, don't sort of cop out on this and say, well, this is how we were built and we can't do much about it. What do you think, Anna? Yeah, I think it's a really good point. Like we can't just um, like pretend that there's not a lot of buildings that have already been built and that have the potential of performing much better than they do at the moment. And there, there are things that we can do. As Paul said, um, there's, there's a role that the governments are playing. And for example, if we look into an example of how we can help companies uh, focus in this like refurbishing, repairing, retrofitting, upgrading buildings. Uh, we've got example of the European Green Deal. They launched this instrument called the Renovation Wave, which focuses on how can 
we make sure that we use circular design principles uh, to uh, have better insulated bu buildings, have um, buildings that have um, much better performance and so that the quality of life of people living in them increases. And I think that um, it's, it's very important that while doing this, um, uh, like while doing this uh, upgrading or like refurbishment of the buildings, we don't forget that the, the resources are limited. So how can we do it in a way that we think about long-term and that they last? How can we keep track of the resources that we are using now to put up there? And what type of design strategies can we use? Do we actually need to own the lightning, for example? We have examples such as companies like Philips who are placing lightning in uh, lighting in a lot of uh, big buildings, such as uh, Schiphol Airport in the Netherlands. And what they make sure is that those lights are long lasting and that they are they have low maintenance. And what Schiphol Airport paid is pay is for the light, not the bulbs. And I think that this is a fantastic way in seeing that we don't need to own products and materials. What we need is access to light, access to air conditioning or heating. And we need access to um, like a high quality indoor air, for example. And how can we do that? Well, modularity, um, thinking about um, products as a service and other types of strategies is the best way to address this. Again, it's about thinking about it very differently. And this is really it. It's about bringing that creativity in at an early stage. Um, Paul, you talked a lot about the concept of holistic design. And I know many of the projects you've worked on, you know, older projects like the, you know, the work that you did in London Bridge, you were talking about, you know, an older station that you can't close down. You're not going to knock it down. So you have to make it work. But also, you know, we want to see the buildings that are built today. We want to see them last for a very long time. So. Can we manage to do both? Well, we, we, we have to. Uh, we, <laughs> there's simply not an option. The question is, how do we, how do we mainstream the kind of uh, principles and ideas that we've been discussing today so that we do create that change? Um, and you know, the good news is there are a, a number of fabulous examples around the world where if you do put those principles first, um, and for example, um, with my own uh, practice, Grimshaw, you know, back in the 1970s, we, we built um, a furniture factory, um, but we designed it for deconstruction um, with the idea that actually understanding that the, the purpose of that building may change over its lifetime. And then fast forward 40 years, a university in southwest England, Bath Spa University, actually um, took over the building and said, we'd like to adapt and change so it could be a teaching laboratory. And they came back to us and approached us. Um, and actually in a very short uh, space of time, we did the renovations. So we've extended the product life. Now, the issue is that we need to build the skills and the capacity so that um, we're able to see these examples, not just being one, one of a kind, but being, being plentiful. And, and so this point about research and development, um, uh, and, and we're working uh, on a EU project called Circuit, um, and that has a, a number of opportunities. That's collaborating with policymakers, with developers, and looking at a range of activities that we need. So, for example, how do you extend uh, the life of a building? What are the urban planning instruments that will be required so that we can push those principles um, in, in, in spatial design? Uh, what is the opportunity to, to work with product manufacturers so that can really truly understand how we can design for disassembly um, and faster construction? Um, and, and equally, how do, we, how do we transfer this knowledge? How do we share this in an equitable way so that we can move the market in the right direction? So we're not there yet, but I think we've got the building blocks that could really be useful. Um, and it is all about collaboration and working together in an integrated way to solve this problem. It is, and indeed more so than, than ever before. Michael, come in here and tell us, what can you know, construction companies do to actually you know, help make sure that they're very much part of the circular economy? 
Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting question. So I think basically construction companies have uh, to play a great role in this process. So it's especially up to them how they adopt uh, the circular economy, how they uh, transform a circular econ economy into reality. So if I look uh, how we are doing things in the construction business, so since ever we are into modular construction, so off-site manufacturing and standardized uh, construction processes. So it's all about um, uh, grown expertise where uh, a construction company should focus on how can they build efficiently reducing waste and pollution, which, is, which are uh, some of the key elements of the circular economy, not only um, through the uh, construction process itself, but especially during the uh, running phase of a building. A building has different life cycle phases. And um, I'm pretty sure that a good quality uh, or a good construction quality will enhance the building performance throughout the years in terms of energy efficiency, in terms of um, longevity of the building, of the asset. At the end, we are talking also about investments when we talk about investors, owners. So they are going to invest into a, um, into a long life product. And finally, we are also talking about the disassembling phase. So how can we uh, dismantle buildings efficiently and reusing materials. So all of this can already be considered uh, during the design phase of a building, uh, relying on uh, uh, grown expertise and standardization, as well as digitization. So this is also now a very important point that we are going, uh, we are um, approaching very fast as a construction industry right now. So I think there are a lot of opportunities for the construction companies right now. Oh, really? Yes, without a doubt. And they need to take advantage of it again. And I think, as everybody is saying there, work closer, you know, with everybody, with the developers and with the architects, with everybody to make sure that they can be really part of this. Ibrahim, let me come back to you. I mean, when we all think of Majid al Futain, particularly here in the region, I mean, you're a major commercial player here. And I know we look at the Saudi market now and everybody's looking at the Saudi market. You know, you're going to be building a lot of, you know, hypermarkets and cinemas and lots of buildings there. And indeed, your, your expansion in the region. But do you have, you know, your way of working and then you bring in the supply chain with you and you talk to your suppliers? Because, well, you know, you want to have and you have the aspirations on the circular economy. Can you bring everybody else into this and you know, can you lay roll this out, so to speak, what you do in one country is the same as the other, whereby in many ways you're you're upping the standards for some people and for others. Thank you. Thank you so much. Briefly, yes, uh, whatever I do, um, I'm in charge when it comes to sustainability across all our markets. So it's not only in the UAE, but also uh, wherever we are. So Saudi, Jordan, Kuwait, Egypt, Georgia, Uganda, Uzbekistan. Uh, Kenya, so all these countries, because it's an overarching policy for all our operating companies in all our countries of operation. Back to the supply chain, we've been working with the supply chain since day one on different things other than circular economy. One of it is the labor rights, the migrant labors mainly, the accommodation uh, rights, as well as uh, the uh, salaries and all these things. So we have a, a, a policy about the well-being of our uh, uh, our uh, our own employees, as well as the people who work uh, with us, uh, tier one suppliers and tier two suppliers. So, and as we speak, uh, we just uh, launched our sustainable procurement policy. So we worked very close for the last year and a half with our procurement uh, team, as well as our supply chain on sustainable procurement. And when it comes to circularity. Uh, I believe the supply, especially in construction, uh, we cannot achieve our supply, our uh, 2030 circular economy target without the engagement and support and dedication of our supply chain. So it's not only a magic for time, uh, global target when it comes to circular economy. Yes, we will have by 20, it will be the core of our business, 
But when it comes to implementation, achieving the targets, we will be working and we are still working with the supply chain as well as the governments. And I mentioned the government. So we need to have, uh, we're working for them for the regulations and uh, as well as when it comes to the FDI department, uh, highlighting the, innov the innovation that can come with the investment in circular economy. A great tick, for example, we're going to do with the, with the, and we are piloting in Carrefour, is uh, using a blockchain for traceability for our, for, with our farmers. And uh, so we want our customer to know where this item came from, where it will end, and who did it, and if it's being uh, paid fairly or not. So we're working on that as well. Um, and uh, we're coming close to the end of this. Paul, if I can uh, give you maybe a closing word on this here, when we think about, you know, we everybody we talk to wants to be very much part of this. I think we've certainly got people on board in terms of the theory concept. People know it's the right thing to do, but how do we really move this towards, um, you know, a global circular economy? And is there is there a possibility to do this? Well, I think uh, events like this really help raise awareness, and I think that's really important. Um, they demonstrate that um, across the whole value chain in construction, we are talking about this. Um, we know we need to do it. There are fantastic examples. Abraham has, has given them. We've got examples where whole cities are redefining their economies for circularity. So I think there's a number of really good indicators that we are making progress. We just need to speed that up. And the only way we can do that is to make sure we have the right policy, the right investment, willing developers like Abraham and his business, and then we can make it happen. Well, we're going to have to leave it there, I'm afraid. And I know I'd wanted to come back to Anna, but we have so much that uh, we could talk about. So I think everybody will have a look online and see all the great work that all of you are doing with um, the MacArthur Foundation at Majid al Qutaym at Grimshaw, and indeed at Wolf Systems. So much great work and keep it up because I think it is, it's leaders like yourself in the industry that are pushing the agenda. And this is, I think, a lot of people, a bit of good peer pressure doesn't harm at all. So well done. That was a great conversation. Thank you all so much. And again, you know, thank you, Michael, for moderating. Thank you, Paul, Anna, and to Ibrahim. Thank you all so much.